Initially lured by the island's resources, Rome's entanglement with Britain begins with Julius Caesar's expeditions and evolved into a full-scale conquest under Emperor Claudius. This error of Roman rule introduced a profound transformation in British society, economy, and landscape. Epitomized by flourishing cities, the construction of Hadrian's Wall, and the Romanization of the British elite. However, the stability and prosperity under Roman dominion were increasingly undermined by economic challenges, internal dissent, and barbarian incursions. The 4th century witnessed a gradual but irreversible decline in Roman authority, culminating in an official withdrawal of Roman forces around 410 AD, which left Britain to navigate the turbulent waters of the post-Roman world completely on its own. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, well, it's great to see you again. If you want to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description and comments. Otherwise, a like, comment, subscribe goes a long way. And now, with that out of the way, let's begin our topic. Roman Britain The ancient world, including the Greeks, Phoenicians, and Carthaginians, were well aware of Britain, engaging in trade for the coveted Cornish tin as early as the 4th century BC. Known as the Tin Islands, or Cassiterides, these lands were thought to be situated along Europeans' western shores. Notable figures such as the Carthaginian mariner Himilco and the Greek explorer Pythias, are believed to have explored Britain during the 6th to 5th centuries BC and the 4th century respectively. Although its existence was sometimes questioned or deemed mythical by certain scholars of the time. Julius Caesar's Ventures in 55 to 54 BC, marked Rome's initial direct engagement with Britain during his campaign to conquer Gaul, prompted by suspicions of British support for the Gaulish resistance. The first of these expeditions, primarily exploratory, managed to secure a position on Kent's coast, but could not progress due to storm-induced ship damage and a notable scarcity of cavalry. Nevertheless, this attempt was deemed a political triumph in Rome, celebrated with a twenty-day festivity in honour of Caesar's successors, including taking hostages from Britain and defeating the tribes of the Belgae upon his return to mainland Gaul. But it wasn't over for Caesar yet. He went back to Britain. In his subsequent invasion, Caesar led a significantly larger force back to the island, persuading or perhaps compelling various indigenous Celtic tribes to submit, offering hostages and tribute for peace. He established Mandubracius a cooperative local leader, reinstating him to power, and subdued his adversary, Cassivellaunus. Although hostages were also secured, it still remains a matter of debate about whether tribute was consistently paid following Caesar's departure back to Gaul. Now one thing that is notable Caesar did not annex any land, nor leave Roman forces behind in Britain. But he did establish client relationships, effectively bringing Britain 
under Rome's influence. Augustus, however, considered launching invasions in 34, 27, and 25 BC. Yet these plans never materialized due to unfavorable conditions, leading to a period of somewhat peaceful trade and diplomacy between Britain and Rome. Strabo, writing during the late period of Augustus's rule, suggested that the revenues from trade taxes exceeded what could have been gained through conquest. So, really, the game was not worth the candle to just annex the entire island. It was too far away anyway. Stretching out the baggage train like that is way too complicated. Now, this error saw an uptick in luxury imports in southeastern Britain, corroborated by modern archaeological findings. So, of course, the Brits had gained somewhat of a taste among the upper classes for Roman goods. Strabo also recorded British monarchs who sought diplomatic relations with Augustus, who mentioned receiving British rulers seeking asylum in his historical records. And notably, during Tiberius's Germanic campaigns in 16 AD, Roman ships blown off course to Britain returned with quite a few interesting tales to tell. Well, the fact that they returned, that is a feat in itself. Now Rome, at least at this time, preferred to maintain a balance of power among southern British tribes, notably backing the powerful Catsevelani under Tasciovanus's lineage and the Atrabates, led by Comius's descendants. The strategy persisted until around 39 or 40 AD, when Caligula entertained an exiled Catavellanian prince and mooted an invasion of Britain that ultimately never occurred due to the absurdity of the failures in Gaul at the time. Now, Claudius's successful invasion in 43 AD was ostensibly to support Verica of the Atrebates, who was another British leader in exile. The Roman assault on Britain in 43 AD was spearheaded by Aulus Plotius, though the exact number of legions involved seems somewhat ambiguous. The only legion explicitly recorded as participating is the Legio II Augusta, under the command of Vespasian. Yes, that Vespasian, the one who would later become emperor. But it's also speculated that the Legio IX Hispana and several other legions played critical roles in the suppression of the Boudican Revolt around 60 to 61. Well, it seems that these other legions, including the 20th uh, Valeria Victrix and the 15th Gemina, later known as Martia Victrix, were part of the initial landing force. So they certainly showed up with their guns loaded. Now, one must remember that the historical documentation is not definitive, due to the Roman military's practice of reassigning units as needed. Now, the Ninth Hispana's presence is suggested by its later stationing in Eboracum, which was modern-day York, around 71. There's also an inscription there, dated to about 108, before it met its end somewhere in the Empire's eastern territories, which was possibly due to the Bar Kokhba revolt. A video on that, that I did about a few days ago, I believe. Fresh in the memory. Now, 
A mutiny among troops was actually one of the main things that delayed the invasion, which was only quelled after an imperial freedman convinced them of the importance of their mission beyond the familiar world. Well, after a great deal of talking about this, they set off in three groups, likely making landfall at Richborough in Kent, with a possible secondary landing near Fishburne in West Sussex. The Roman forces quickly engaged and overcame the Catavellani and their allies in two significant battles, one likely near the Medway River, and one other by the Thames. The Thames is the river that runs through modern-day London, by the way. The conflict saw the death of Togodomus, one of their leaders, though his brother, Caratacus, escaped to continue resistance efforts elsewhere. Awaiting Claudius's arrival with heavy reinforcements, including war elephants and artillery, Plautius paused his advance by the Thames. These reinforcements were crucial in the march towards the Catavellanian stronghold, Camelodunum, that's modern-day Colchester. In parallel, Vespasian was instrumental in pacifying the southwest, while treaties were secured with other tribes and Cogidubnus was installed as a client king over multiple regions, stabilizing Roman power and influence in the newly conquered lands. With the southern part of the island now firmly under Roman control, the Empire's forces turned their focus towards what is presently known as Wales. The Salures, Decalangi, Ordovices, proved to be tenacious opponents, engaging Roman attention for the initial decades, despite occasional revolts by Roman allies like the Brigantes and the Iceni. Now, under the leadership of Caratacus, the Salures waged a rather effective guerrilla war against the governor Publius Ostorius Scapula until about 51 AD when Scapula managed to draw Caratacus into open battle, and that resulted in his defeat. It's much more difficult to fight Romans when they're on even ground, and much easier to just jump out of the forest and start stabbing. Just ask the Germans. Now, seeking sanctuary with the Brigantes, Caratacus was unfortunately betrayed by their queen, Cartimandua, who promptly handed him over to the Romans. Well, despite being paraded in Claudius's triumph in Rome, Caratacus's eloquent plea for mercy spared him from execution. Well, even with Caratacus out of the picture, the Salure's resistance persisted and Venutius, Cartimandua's former husband, emerging as the new rebel leader. Things changed a little bit upon Nero's rise to power. The Roman-controlled territory of Britain extended northwards to Lindum. The newly appointed governor, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, undertook a campaign against the druid stronghold of Mona, also known as Anglesey, in 60-61 AD, decimating the druid population and destroying their sacred groves. If you don't know what a druid is, go and watch my video on the druids, and after watching it you'll know what a druid is. Now, concurrently, the southeast of Britain revolted under Boudicca, the widow of the Iceni king Prasutagus. The Roman annexation of Iceni lands 
under the guise of enforcing Prasadagus's will, led to a rather brutal uprising. With Boudicca's forces annihilating the Roman colony of Camelodunum, London, and Verulamanium. Well, Paulinus, however, did manage to defeat the warrior queen Boudicca's significantly larger force in the Battle of Watling Street, leading to her demise. But it was a pretty valiant effort. And the rebellion was such a shock that it almost prompted Emperor Nero to withdraw the Roman presence from Britain completely. Almost, but not quite. The tumultuous Year of the Four Emperors in 69 AD saw further instability in Roman Britain, with Venutius seizing the opportunity to control the north after Romans failed to defend Cartimandua. The subsequent Roman governors, Quintus Petulius Carialis and Sextus Julius Frontinus, focused on subjugating the Brigantes and Silures, with Frontinus also exploiting South Wales' mineral wealth, and there was certainly a lot of that. Roman conquests continued under Governor Gnaeus Julius Agricola, who subdued the Ordovices in 78 AD, and secured a significant victory against the Caledonians at the Battle of Mons Graupius in 84 AD. Despite reaching the peak of Roman territorial expansion in Britain, Agricola's recall and the subsequent Roman withdrawal to a more defensible position marked somewhat of a strategic retraction. The military significance of Roman Britain necessitated the posting of future emperors, such as Vespasian, Pertinax, and Gordian I, in governing roles, underlying the province's importance in the Roman Empire. Now, the period following Agricola's departure from Britain remains largely undocumented, with even his successor's names lost to history. However, we've got a little bit of archaeological evidence, which suggests a mixed Roman response to the challenges north of the Fourth Clyde Isthmus. While some forts were expanded, others were seemingly abandoned completely. And by 87 AD, the Roman frontier had at least somewhat stabilized along the Stain Gate. The era's Roman influence in the Scottish lowlands is inferred from Roman coins and pottery found at native sites, which hint at a growing Roman presence. And a crucial source of information from this time comes from the Vindolanda tablets that were found near Hadrian's Wall and dated somewhere between 90 to 110 AD. They shed life on light, rather, on life at a frontier fort, detailing the social and logistical networks that sustained Roman operations at the very edge of the empire. So, around 105 AD, Roman forts in what would become Scotland faced significant destruction, possibly at the hands of Pictish tribes, evidenced by archaeological finds of fire damage and combat at Newstead. Now this turmoil might have coincided with auxiliary reinforcements from Germany and hints at an unrecorded British conflict. The aftermath may have seen a strategic Roman retreat to the Staingate, reinforcing this as the new frontier line. Certainly, Scotland was, at least in terms of the northern perception, the final frontier of the empire. 
and they never really managed to make inroads into Ireland. The early reign of Emperor Hadrian was marked by further unrest in Britannia, quelled finally by Quintus Pompeius Falco. Hadrian's visit around 120 AD prompted the construction of the defensive Hadrian's Wall, which was closely aligned with the Staingate under the governance of Aulus Platorius Nepos, and the introduction of the Legio VI Victrix. This move might relate to the disappearance of the Legio IX Hispana amidst the broader instability in Scotland. The frontier extended north again, under Antoninus Pius, around 142, with the Antonine Wall marking a temporary reassertion into the Scottish lowlands by Quintus Lollius Urbicus. This fluctuating boundary reflects the era's political and military challenges, and it underscores the complexity of the northern frontier dynamics, always changing and chopping back and forth, whether at the will of the Romans or the mysterious barbarians that lay beyond. Now, the initial Roman occupation of Scotland under Antoninus Pius came to an end due to a crisis between 155 and 157, sparked by a rebellion of the Brigantes. With reinforcements limited, Roman forces retreated southwards, although the revolt was eventually quelled by Governor Gnaeus Julius Verus. The Antonine Wall was briefly reclaimed within a year, but by 163, it was again relinquished. The second period of occupation might have been influenced by Antoninus' desire to protect allies or extend the empire's boundaries. Yet the return to Hadrian's wall soon after his death suggests a strategic reassessment of the wall's value. And notably, Roman military presence persisted in Scotland, maintaining the large Newstead fort and several smaller outputs all the way until 180 AD. Well, during the subsequent two decades, that's the decades following 157, Rome's focus began to shift on its Danubian provinces with an increase in coin hoards in Britain hinting at unsettled conditions. Usually, when people are running away, they'll bury all of their coins and their valuables. And if they don't get back in time to find them, well, we find them. Hundreds or thousands of years later. Now, significant Roman silver found in Scotland implies that the Romans might have been paying tributes to the Picts under treaty agreements, despite all of the ongoing hostilities. Money talks. In 175 AD, a substantial contingent of Sarmatian cavalry was dispatched to Britain, likely in response to revolts, but these have gone unrecorded. The most severe conflict of Commodus's reign occurred in 180 AD, when the Picts managed to breach Hadrian's Wall, leading to the death of its governor as detailed by Cassius Dio. Ulpius Marcellus's appointment as the new governor bought a temporary peace, at least for four years until 184, when he faced a mutiny over his stringent policies. He was not very popular at all. Now, despite the election of a new leader being declined, Marcellus narrowly escaped with his life. The Britannic Roman army's defiance persisted, with demands leading to the execution of the Praetorian prefect Tigitius Perennis 
It seems the Romans had enough trouble fighting the Picts without fighting each other. Well, Pertinax, the future emperor, was then tasked with suppressing the mutiny. Despite initial success, the riot ensued, and after being attacked, Pertinax requested a recall to Rome, where he briefly ascended to the imperial throne in 192 following Commodus. Now, after Commodus's death, who is indeed a very interesting character, and you should watch my video on him, the Roman Empire was plunged into turmoil, leading to a civil war, and a very brutal one at that. Pertinax's brief reign gave way to a power struggle, with Septimius Severus and Britannia's governor Claudius Albinus among the key contenders. Albinus, enjoying support from both British natives and three legions, was seen as a formidable claimant. Initially allied with Severus to defeat Pescius Niger in the east, Albinus was later betrayed as Severus sought to consolidate his power. Albinus was moved to Gaul in 195, and his establishment of Lugdunum led to a decisive confrontation with Severus in the following year, ending in Albinus's defeat and unlifing of himself. Severus's subsequent actions against Albinus's supporters underscored the volatility in Rome that Britain represented. With its command of significant military forces, offering a launching pad for ambitious political rivals. Of course, the aftermath saw a new character, Virius Lupus, forced to negotiate peace with the troublesome Meate tribe, indicating ongoing instabilities. Severus's response to a report detailing the barbarian threat was a military expedition to Britain aiming to quell the unrest, and possibly to instill some martial values in his sons, Caracalla and Geta. Apparently they were a little bit too soft, and needed to, as we say in Australia, drink some concrete and harden up. Severus's campaign into Caledonia, marked by a rather significant guerrilla resistance, along with harsh conditions, culminated in treaties that had very little lasting impact on the Northern Territory status. And his death in 211 led to a retraction to Hadrian's Wall, with his division of Britannia in two provinces attempting to curb the power of individual governors. Now this period known as the Long Peace, saw efforts to manage internal and external pressures, including piracy, which led to the development of the Saxon shore forts. Despite relative stability, economic challenges and broader imperial crises of the 3rd century certainly had their impact on Britannia as much as everywhere else and it culminated in the Corasian Revolt and the brief establishment of a Britannic Empire, highlighting the ongoing turmoil of Roman rule in Britannia, this power yo-yoing back and forth between whoever can manage to hold it for the longest. Kind of like a game of hot potato, but just passing around the politics of the Britannic Empire, or whatever we want to refer to it to, depending on the time. Now, under Diocletian's reorganization, Roman Britain was structured into a diocese governed by a vicarius, positioned beneath a Praetorian prefect, notably Junius Bassus from 318 to 331, who resided in Augusta Trivornum. That's Trier in modern tongue. 
the Vicarius, headquartered in Londinium, the diocese's chief city, oversaw the diocese's administration, and Londinium, alongside Eboracum, remained pivotal as the provincial capitals, with the territory subdivided into smaller provinces to enhance administrative efficiency. Another significant shift in authority redefined the roles within the province. Civilian and military powers were separated. While governors were trained in administrative duties, emphasizing financial responsibilities, military command was transferred to the Dux Britannarium by 314. This figure commanded the northern region troops, particularly those guarding Hadrian's Wall, enjoying a considerable amount of autonomy due to the geographical distance from central Roman governance. The vicarious's role entailed supervising governors and ensuring the smooth operation of the treasury and crown estates, despite having separate administrative frameworks entirely. As the top civilian authority in the region, the vicarious had broad oversight over administrative processes, exerting control, albeit not absolute, over the governors. Now we have some documentation from the early 4th to the early 5th centuries, including the Verona list, Sextus Rufus's writings, and list of officers by Polemius Silvius, and it identifies four initial provinces, with the first two having very creative names, Britannia I, Britannia II, Maxima Caesarinaris, and Flavia Caesarinensis. Each governed by a praesis of equestrian rank. But by the fifth century, a fifth province, Valentia, appears, with its governor and that of Maxima elevated to consular rank. Now, the establishment of Valentia, as recounted by Ammianus following the great conspiracy's suppression in 369 by Count Theodosius, is seen as either a revival of a previously lost province, or potentially an entirely new entity, speculated by some to have been situated even beyond Hadrian's Wall, possibly in the region once abandoned south of the Antonine Wall. Analyzing ecclesiastical records sheds light on the organization of the provinces and their capitals in this era, with scholars often referencing the bishop list from 314 Council of Arles to align ecclesiastical structures with the Roman administrative hierarchy. However, inaccuracies in the list, especially regarding the British delegation, certainly seem to complicate interpretations. Various amendations have been proposed over the years to rectify the listing of a bishop, a Boreas, from Iberacum, and two from Londinium, reflecting the diverse and historical and geographical speculations ranging from Colchester to Lincoln and even Carleon as potential locations. Now, moving much later on, into the 12th century, Gerald of Wales outlined an ecclesiastical structure involving metropolitan sees, purportedly established by S. S. Fagan and Duvian, assigning them to regions that largely overlap with the Roman provincial divisions, but with some rather imaginative geography particularly in placing Valentia in what he now calls Albania, now Scotland, and advocating for the ancient stature of St. Andrews. Now, modern reconstructions tend to adjust these assignments, often situating Maxima in Londinium due to its vicarial seat, 
Prima in the west, with its capital moved to Kirinchester for archaeological regions. Flavia, north of Maxima, with Lincoln as its capital aligning with one correction of the Aulis bishop list, and Secunda in the north, centred in York. Valentia's placement remains somewhat debated, with suggestions ranging from northern Wales to areas adjacent or between Hadrian and Antonine walls, reflecting the ongoing challenge in pinpointing the exact administrative and ecclesiastical geography of Roman Britain. Now back to Roman times. During Emperor Constantius's final expedition to Britannia in 306, amidst his declining health, he led military operations into the northern reaches of the island, aiming to subdue the Picts beyond the formidable barrier of Hadrian's Wall. And, by the way, if you quickly do a little Google search of Hadrian's Wall, it doesn't really look like much. But back in the day, it was pretty good. Now, the historical record of these campaigns is pretty minimal, and therefore it's largely inconclusive hinting at a significant battle in the northern territories during early summer, after which the emperor retreated southward. That's all we really know about that one with Constantius. But this period is also marked by the military apprenticeship of his son, Constantine, and we all know him, also known as Constantine the Great, right? He actually accompanied his father in these northern endeavours, certainly an eye-opening experience. Now Constantius's demise in York that July saw Constantine at his side, setting the stage for Constantine's ascent to power, leveraging his British base to claim the imperial purple a stark contrast to the fate of the usurper Albinus decades earlier. The mid-fourth century saw Britannia's brief allegiance to the usurper Magnentius, who rose to power following the assassination of Constans. The ultimate defeat of Magnentius in 353 at Mons Seleucus prompted Constantius II to dispatch Paulus Catina to purge the province of the usurper's sympathizers. However, Catina's mission quickly spiralled into a draconian witch-hunt, compelling Flavius Martinus, the vicarius of Britannia, to intervene. The confrontation escalated when Martinus, faced with accusations of treason by Paulus, attempted to eliminate the notary in a desperate act that culminated in his own unlifing. A tragic close to a turbulent chapter in Britannia's history. And as the 4th century advanced, Britannia found itself increasingly under siege, facing relentless incursions from eastern Saxons and western Scoti. The Western Scoti were the Irish. They were just effectively calling them Western Scots. Now, despite a network of coastal forts that were established circa 280 to counter these threats, the simultaneous onslaught by Saxons, Picts, Scoti, and the Atacoti in 367, coupled with the internal descent among Hadrian's Wall's garrison, brought the province to its knees in an event often termed the Barbarian Conspiracy. Now this catastrophic breach saw the decimation of Britannia's western and northern defences, leading to widespread urban pillage. Now the crisis was eventually quelled by Count Theodosius in 368, who initiated a series of strategic, military, and administrative reforms after a landing at Bononia, which is modern-day Bologna-Semir, 
and setting up operations in Londonium. Through a combination of amnesty for deserters and military resilience, Theodosius managed to restore order, capture Hadrian's Wall, and re-establish control over the beleaguered province, culminating in the establishment of Valentia as the new province to enhance governance in the north. This period also saw the appointment of Dulcitus as the new Dux Britanniarum, and the introduction of Civilis to oversee civilian affairs. But it couldn't all be safe and sound. The precarious stability was again disrupted in 383, when Magnus Maximus, proclaiming himself emperor, rallied forces at Segontium, and embarked on campaigns that extended across the Western Empire, even achieving victories against the Picts and the Scots. His military endeavours, however, drained Britannia of critical defences, leading to the desertion of strategic forts and enabling Irish incursions and settlements in the north of Wales. The downfall of Maximus in 388 marked the beginning of the end for Roman military presence in Britannia, with subsequent barbarian invasions around 396 necessitating a punitive response led by Stilicho. Although peace was momentarily restored in 399, the empire's dwindling military resources prompted further withdrawals by 401 to counter the threat of Alaric I of the Visigoths, signaling a fading grip of Rome over not only its distinct Britannic province, but of its own namesake. Now, the prevailing historical perspective depicted a broad economic downturn at the dawn of the 5th century. But some archaeological discoveries do challenge this narrative, and it prompts a bit of a reassessment of the written knowledge. The consensus acknowledges certain developments, though, a trend towards more luxurious, yet fewer urban residences, the rich getting rich, the poor getting poorer, which is generally not a good thing. There was also a cessation in new public constructions, except for fortifications, and also a proliferation of dark earth layers, as described by some texts, indicating a heightened horticultural activity within city boundaries. An example of early urban decline is seen in the late 3rd century repurposing of Silchester's Basilica for industrial use, a change that was likely sanctioned by authorities. Now, contrary to earlier beliefs, the desertion of certain locales appears to have occurred later than initially assumed. While many structures re were repurposed rather than demolished. Moreover, barbarian incursions predominantly targeted exposed rural areas over the urban centres. Evidence from villas like Chedworth and Great Casterton suggests that economic hardships were not universal, as demonstrated by the laying of new mosaic floors during this period. Well, despite a general decline, some areas, such as Verulanium and Kirinchester, saw the construction of new buildings, and urban centres like Canterbury and Kirinchester as well continue to thrive into the 5th and even the 6th centuries amidst expansive agricultural estates. Which I suppose is kind of like saying now if you would have a millionaire sitting in his nice apartment saying to you, I don't know what you're complaining about. It all seems fine to me. I just put a new swimming pool in. That's pretty much the situation in Chedworth and Great Casterton. Now, by the latter part of the 4th century, 
urban vitality had significantly waned, and it was mirrored by the scarcity of coins that were minted between 378 and 88, which gives us a potential for an economic contraction, reduced military presence, or perhaps general instability during Magnus Maximus's reign. That was 383 to 87. Although coin circulation did see a moderate, modest recovery in the 390s, rather, it did fall short of prior levels, and quite obviously, with copper coinage becoming exceedingly rare post-402. Despite the presence of silver and gold coins in hordes, indicating their continued existence in the province, by 407 the influx of new Roman coins had dwindled, and by 430 coin-base trade had likely completely ceased. Of course, after this, the Romans were gone. The people of Britannia were left to their own devices. But they certainly developed their own great culture. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that I'm doing these videos somewhat chronologically, so I will get to Britain. And if you didn't know, my father's British. So I should probably be doing a little bit more British history. And that's exactly what I'll do in later videos. But for now, I'd like to thank you for listening and getting this far. And I'd also like to thank my Mega Chad tier patrons, JC and Stark Factory. Complete Chads, for sure. If you would like to support the channel, follow the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, just like, comment, and subscribe. And tell your friends that there's a new historian in town. And he means business. Good night, everybody. See you in the next video.